Welcome, Mark. How are you? I'm lovely. Thank you very much. I just uh, taught day one of the Safer Architects, Architects class. So I'm fresh from a day of speaking, but speaking about this. So I'm, I'm still in the zone. Nice. But I might be a little That's bit awesome. Um, we're doing that a couple weeks. So I'm looking. Okay, cool. All right. Um, everybody, this is Mark Ricks, a safe fellow out of California. Uh, been a long time friend of Pretty Agile. Really excited. Thank you so much for, for offering to join us today to talk a little bit about the role of architect and safe. Um, take it away, Mark. My pleasure. Thank you. Uh, well, so what's my time box, Adrian? Uh, I think we're an hour, hour mark, um, um, but we'll We'll take as much time as, as you're willing. <laughs> when people drop off, they drop off. But we're scheduled for an hour. Okay. Uh, great. So I've prepared. I prepared some slides, and um, I, there is there's about half the deck that I really want to emphasize. So I'll go through half the deck, and that's really architect roles and responsibilities in safe, and contrasting those with traditional architectural roles. Um, and then we can go further than that if you'd like to. I have a little bit of extra content if there's interest. So um, I will, I'll start it up and see how it goes. Give me a second to share. Okay, can you see me? You're good. Okay, get started. A um, little bit of a nod to Star Wars here. Everybody's seen Star Wars, right? They, they know what I'm talking about here. These aren't the architects you're looking for. Nice, love it. So I've, had, I've had Star Wars on my mind um, basically all through this COVID situation because you know what's the first thing families started doing under quarantine? Um, it, this coincided with the release of Disney Plus. So I think the first thing everybody did when they realized they were going to be stuck with their families for the next foreseeable future, right, with no end in sight, was subscribe to Disney Plus and watch all of the Star Wars movies in binge mode. Did anybody else do that? Or was I, with, I was the only one. Well, so I did that. So I've been thinking about Star Wars ever since. So I thought I'd take the opportunity to uh, kind of blend the two, you know, architect perspective and, uh, and that sort of, you know, Jedi mind trick, these aren't the architects you're looking for uh, sort of thing into this, in this presentation. Hopefully it'll be fun and hopefully it'll be a little bit inf in informative too, uh, but very informal. Let's start with what is architecture? Well, before we get into that, I've got a question for M and Adrian. This is a safe meetup, right? So we're all safe friends. Yeah, all, all safe, safe right? friends. Yeah, yeah. This is a safe place. Safe place. All right. <laughs> That's good to know. So I've got some safe terminology in here. Um, and if it wasn't a safe audience, I'd have to spend a little bit more time talking about some of the buzzwords. But sounds like I don't have to do that. Let's start with what is architecture in the first place? Um, there's this thing. We've got our IEEE standards. I don't know if you've got separate standards bodies over there in your part of the world, but uh, we tend to reference this IEEE standard. And this, this definition I've seen um, as sort of the go-to working definition of architecture since it was ratified in the year 2000 fundamental organization of a system embodied in its components, their relationships to each other, and the environment. Is anybody else getting sleepy? <laughs> it's kind of what it is, right? But that kind of describes architecture in a nutshell. It's, it's highly wordy. There's a lot to do and kind of dry and boring, right? <clears throat> well, not anymore. I prefer this definition. I think that's much more to the point. Very hard to put a pin on it, especially when we're talking about agile architecture. It's always changing. Nothing is really static about it. 
And it's really about the important stuff, whatever that is, and whoever can help us discern what the important stuff is. So whatever the important stuff is, let's go glom onto that and figure out how to make the best of it. So when I think about what agile architecture is, what architecture is, I tend to go more in this direction, Ralph Johnson's direction than the traditional IEEE direction. But Ralph was part of the IEEE standards committee. So um, he's got street cred in both camps. So if that's what architecture is, who does the architecture? That's what I really want to talk about. <clears throat> we have these domains and can we do a show of hands? This is Zoom, so we have, we have some feedback capabilities, right? We have some, can we do reactions here? Thumbs up, thumbs down, thumbs up. Thumbs up, who, who's familiar with these terms who either have heard of these, um, you are one, you have done one, these resonate with you. Okay, good. Yeah, lots of, lots of thumbs up in the air. So traditionally, we see a lot of these kinds of architects in environments. And, um, you know, I can say whenever, whenever I go into a company, um, you know, either on a coaching basis or consulting basis or even teaching like I'm doing now with a, with a company out of Colorado, um, I see that many people have these titles or titles close to them. We have business architects that are focused on um, doing architecture that aligns very closely with the business. Um, you know, maybe it's process oriented stuff where we're aligning to strategic themes, we're aligning to budgets, we're aligning on multi-year strategies, multi-year roadmaps. Um, we have information architecture or data architecture. These are people who are intently focused on the data and how information moves and how it's stored, how it's protected at rest, those kinds of things. Different architectural perspectives, different domains and people who have titles that reflect their specialties in these areas. So that's all well and good and we see these a lot. Problem is, in SAFE, these aren't the architects we're looking for. These are the architects we're looking for. So I'm going to be blunt. In, in SAFE, there are three and only three architecture roles. We have the enterprise architect, we have the solution architect, and the system architect. <clears throat> we don't have application architects in SAFE. We don't have security architects. We don't have cloud architects. We don't have business architects in SAFE. Does anybody feel like we've missed something? Just quick poll, be perfectly honest. If I ended the presentation now, would you think, hey, these guys are smoking dope and they don't get it. They're leaving a big gap. I did the first time I saw SAFE because I'm an architect and I've spent most of my career either as a practicing architect or a leader of architecture teams. And so when I first started wrapping my head around SAFE and I saw enterprise architects, solution architects, system architect, and I come from a, a more or less a TOGAF background with some Gartner Meta mixed in and maybe a little sprinkling of Zachman, I thought, these guys are missing a bunch of stuff. When are they gonna get their act together and really talk about um, the full spectrum of architecture disciplines? Well, then I got to know it better. <clears throat> and then I, had opportunities to influence the direction and influence the key messaging around this part of the framework. And this is really where we stand with these three roles. So to unpack these three roles a little bit more, we have these distinctions. Um, and I like to work this slide from right to left. This is the second time I've presented this slide today, by the way. If we start on the right, System architects, these are um, uh, the, maybe the finest grained definition of 
of architects we have or, or the, this, the architects that are closest to the technology. System architects really own a um, own the system. They're, they're responsible for a single system from soup to nuts, from glass to metal. This could be a single product or a single service or a single stovepipe or a single solution within, within the enterprise or um, within the technology ecosystem. Um, then we move to the left. The solution architects start to expand in scope a little bit, not just a single system, but they work across systems. They might be subject matter experts in, uh, in how to integrate different, different uh, disparate systems into more distributed, integrated solutions. So as we move from the system architect to solution architect, we start to get a little bit more general, a little less deep in terms of knowledge and expertise of the product stack, and a little bit more general this way. We start to widen out a little bit. Then we get to enterprise architects who work across value streams. And at this level, we're really talking about um, shepherding and representing the architecture vision and strategy across lines of business, across functional domains, across departments, um, helping to align technology strategy among uh, disparate business units or domains, functional domains within the enterprise. So at this level, um, enterprise architects tend to be a lot more wide than they are deep. So now we have much more general capabilities at the enterprise architect level that are, that are uh, removed from the technology more so than the solution architects and the system architects are, but much closer to the business. So in, oh, I got ahead of myself. So when we look at the three roles in SAFE, we have these three and they, uh, they sort of represent a dispersion of architecture responsibility across the spectrum from general to specific and close to the business versus um, closer to the technology. So we've kind of covered the gamut, right? With only three roles. But still the question remains, what do we do about those other architecture perspectives? What about security? What about infrastructure? What about data? What about information, application, architecture, et cetera, the traditional architecture domains? Well, this is the big answer. We don't ignore those perspectives. They're still extremely valuable. We need to have those perspectives in play. We need to be able to do business architecture very well. We need to be able to do information architecture, application architecture, and technical architecture, and fill in the blank architecture. Whatever other kind of architecture matters to the environment, um, we need to be able to cover. Other examples could be cloud architecture, security architecture, integration architecture, does anybody else have any other fill in the blank architectures that are important in their environments? We've covered them. Okay, so the point is we're not, oh, there's something in the chat. data architect. Okay, so we got one. Great. So the important thing to understand from a safe point of view is that we're not, we're not taking away the importance of these architectural domains or perspectives. They're still highly relevant, still very important. We still need to be able to cover them. We're just saying that those aren't distinct roles. So we need to be able to do business architecture yet, but we don't need business architects per se to do it. Um, we need to be able to do application architecture, security architecture very well. Those are very important, but we don't necessarily need people with those titles in order to cover those bases. So the way we get around that is we map these domains to our three safe roles and we're gonna stretch them a little bit. We're gonna say, whether you're an enterprise architect, a solution architect or a system architect, you need to understand enough of these domains across the entire spectrum in order to do your job effectively, right? So if I'm an enterprise architect, SAFE is going to challenge me 
to not only know business architecture, but to know information architecture, application, technical, and whatever other architectural perspectives are important in my company so that I can help to build the right solutions. Same with solution architects and system architects. So is this starting to sound like T-shaped architects to anyone? That's really the idea here. So we're moving away from highly specialized um, pigeonholed, for lack of a better term, highly specialized uh, people who, who do one thing very well and one thing only. I'm a business architect and that's what I do. I'm a data architect and that's what I do. If you need technical architecture or integration architecture, talk to somebody else. That's not my monkey, that's not my bag of tricks. So. Um, we're, we're stretching people to go beyond their comfort zone in a lot of cases and to develop skills in other areas so that they're more cross-functional, more T-shaped, right? I am a business architect, or maybe I'm an enterprise architect, and what I do really well right now is business architecture. I know how to integrate with the business. I have FaceTime with executives. Um, I know how to translate strategic themes and business intent and uh, say portfolio strategy and the long-term strategy and mission, vision goals of the firm into technology strategy. And I know how to, I know how to develop um, sort of the process flows and the business architecture that helps define how the business needs to operate in its environment. I'm very good at business architecture, that's what I do. Um, but now, since I'm working in SAFE and now that I'm doing agile architecture, I need to develop expertise in these other domains as well. So what we're doing is we're challenging people to think beyond their, their primary expertise and starting to develop skills in other domains. And every architect should think about how they need to build skills in these other domains in order to round out their capabilities and provide the most value to their arts and organizations. So I wanna stop here and get your reaction. So I wanna know who's reacting to this and in what way? Is it positive, is it negative? Do you challenge us? Do you accept it? Hey Mark, I was gonna just share some experiences that, that we've come across in doing implementations with organizations is, uh, for instance, you walk into a banking context and um, they have, um, on a particular train, when you ring fence the folks and you're thinking about designing that agile release train, um, no kidding, there's nine architects aligned to that space. And people go, well, what do I do with these nine folks? Does it mean I have nine people owning the consciousness of the system architect role? Um, or do we anoint one of them as a system architect and now I've got an eight person problem of what do I do with these folks? Uh, I think that's where a lot of folks start to get confused of how do I, how do I map current state into these states? And then do I, do I have three system architects? Do I have nine system architects? Um, that's, that's a, that's a common feedback that, that, mm -hmm. uh, that, that we encounter. Perspective. Yeah, we, we actually encounter this in class every time we went through this exercise today and um, what we do in class is we, we show this first and then we run an activity against this view where we ask the architects in the room to self-assess. We ask them basically two questions. Number one, which of these roles do you identify with most directly? So do I, do, does it feel like I'm more of a system architect? Does it feel like I'm more of a solution architect or an enterprise architect based on my scope and you know, span of responsibilities within my enterprise today? So align them to columns or align them to a role. And then within that role, we have a worksheet that's an adaptation of this view, which, which at each of these intersections, can you see my mouse, by the way? Can you see what I'm doing? I also, have, I also have this, which allows me to do th fancy things like this. So at, at each of these intersections, 
we have a plus minus. Okay. And we ask them as part of this activity, which is an individual activity. Each, each participant is doing this on their own, just reflecting on their architecture skills. If I enter, if, if I identify as an enterprise architect more than a solution architect or system architect, I'm going to work in this column and I'm going to rate myself on my proficiency across each of those domains. I might say I'm a plus in information architecture. Um, I'm a plus in business architecture, but application architecture, not so much. No, I'm, I used to be technical, but I'm not technical anymore. And maybe I'll fill in, I'll write in cloud. I've gotten pretty good at doing cloud architecture recently. So I've had to lead organizations through cloud migrations and cloud initiatives. So I'm going to rate myself a plus there. And so everybody in class does this individually. And then we put them together. We talk about it and we look for strengths and weaknesses. So um, where I think this starts to dovetail in with what you were talking about, Adrian, with how many architects do we really need? It's after we do this analysis, we understand where the relative strengths and weaknesses are among our architecture staff, and we're able to kind of put them together, right? If we're finding that we have a lot of enterprise architects with a lot of business architecture expertise, like everybody is an enterprise architect or thinks they're a business architect and they have business architecture as their primary expertise, but that means we have gaps in all of these other areas, might tell us that we have too many of these people, right? Awesome, thank you. And there's Does a couple. Of, um, yeah, absolutely. There's even some questions in the chat too. If you um, want to have a look at, if you want to have a look at those, or I can read them to you, that would be helpful. Uh, sure. Let's do both. I was just uh, erasing the ink. Yeah. Um, so Raj said, would it be too much to do for one individual, especially thinking about business and deep technology? It's as if I paid Raj to ask that question. Right. <laughs> right. So after we do this exercise, the very next question we ask, because at this point, usually people are, people, um, if they've been honest with themselves, will have a mix of pluses and negatives in their column. And that will, that will tell them where they might have deficiencies. And they'll be thinking in their minds, well, you know, how am I going to turn this minus into a plus? And do I even have the time or bandwidth to do that? Where am I going to get these extra skills? And very quickly, it might seem overwhelming right? That we're asking them to develop plus level skills in all of these columns in order for them to be effective at their job. That's not what we're saying at all. So where we go immediately to is we recognize that this is a tall order for any architect, just like it's a tall order to expect any developer to also be a tester, a story writer, and uh, an infrastructure builder, and a support person and any number of other things that we're asking to shift left into the development team skill set, right? So just like with architects, um, it's, good, it's a good idea to baseline where you are and understand where your strengths and weaknesses are, but that doesn't mean that you need to shoulder the entire responsibility across the entire spectrum. That's why we have teams. So the answer to your question, Raj, is um, yes, it is usually too much to ask for a single individual to have you know, deep expertise in all of these domains. But we do ask, and it's, um, and it's not too much to ask for architects to start to think about how they can build more skills in these areas, but to um, know where the other people are in the, in the organization that can complement their skills. And especially other, other architects that not only complement their skills, but who they can pair with to help cross train them into those skills. Let's see, so that's Raj. Um, then Rajiv asks, there's a breed colloquially called full stack architects who can cover from strategy to system. Interesting, I haven't heard the, the term full stack applied to architects. But I, I kind of use that as an analogy every time I talk about this. So I say, you know, we have no problem these days talking about full stack developers or, uh, or cross-functional feature teams. So um, is it so much of a stretch 
to think about architecture or, or architects and architecture teams um, using the same vocabulary. So I like that Rajiv is pointing that out. Yeah, often I say, yeah, we have full stack development teams, so why can't we have full stack architects as well? Um, polyglot architects. Binpin, would you like to explain what you mean by that? Yeah, sure. Is just so, so this is again, just an extension to what full stack architects is being called so they can cover across mm -hmm. the domain. So that's the new buzzword that's being used as polyglot architect, polyglot principal architect or engineers that are across the domain. Oh, cool. You're actually seeing that used in industry? Uh, they, they, uh, I see that lots of LinkedIn's. Uh, people have started using that who are safe certified or who are like across multiple domain, maybe not safe certified, but covering lots, lots more than one area. Oh, cool. That's great. That's a new one. Excellent. Thanks for sharing that. Um, uh, TS, TX asks, can you reduce architect workload by, excuse me, by continuing to focus scope horizontally? In other words, component architect, or is that a safe anti-pattern? Uh, you know, I'd be careful with that one. It could be an anti-pattern, but it, it's highly context specific. So in general, we want to avoid those kinds of horizontal specifications, right? Um, or horizontal specializations, component architect. Um, but that's not to say it, it wouldn't work in your context. I would just say, be careful about that. And, uh, you know, make, be able to make full use of those skills. If you have component architects, then, mm -hmm. Um, ensure that they are providing the most value to the art that they can. Would anybody else care to comment on that? Reducing the architect workload by continuing to focus scope horizontally. And um, I don't, but I think I might uh, interpret that a little bit differently or maybe use different words. Um, I would, I, I tend to not think about this as, um, you know, as the goal being to reduce the architect workload, because that can be highly, highly subjective. Um, I don't think that should be the goal um, necessarily. I think the goal should be to maximize the value delivered to the customer. So if, if um, it makes sense to designate component architects such that maximum value can be delivered to customers, then that would be a good thing. One thing that did occur to me, Mark, that it could be thinking about a local optimization that the organization tends to then still be locally optimized of, I do my one thing and I do it very well, um, which means then we could locally optimize as a, a system or a solution um, too much for that one domain to the detriment of others or detriment to the solution. So we, we create performance bottlenecks, for instance. So um, there's always that tension between when I'm the architect that does that one thing very well, I optimize for my thing without seeing the broader picture. Um, right. that, that kind of, perhaps that was part of a challenge too. Right, so I'm gonna riff on that just a little bit more. Tell me what you think about this. If I fill in component architecture there, you know, what, one thing we're not going to do is invent a role in SAFE called component architecture because we think it's the right thing to do, and nor should you. <laughs> if you're doing SAFE, then your architect should have enterprise architect, solution architect, or system ar architect roles. But maybe one thing that a system architect or a group of system architects needs to be able to do very well right now is component architecture. In other words, we need, we need to be very strong in component architecture right now because it matters for some reason that connects directly to being able to deliver maximum business value. But to Adrian's point, you'd wanna be careful not to spend all of your time here for eternity. You'd want to solve those problems, develop that component architecture um, and get to a place where 
maybe you didn't need to spend all of your time on component architecture and you could start moving this way. So the component, ar component architecture still is a perspective, a domain that you need to be able to do really well, but not at the expense of the others. Mark, how do you get away from the situation where you've got a, a smaller company and I say smaller as in, you know, maybe 250 headcount, but you know, you, your, your products and your systems are, are not, the teams are not that big that are working on it. So you haven't found justification for that solution layer yet in SAFE. You've just got two or three arts. So you don't have a solution architect and then you've just got the system architect. Is, is that saying that you need a system architect per system? I mean, you've still got a role there where those systems are talking to each other, interacting with each other. There's that solution level of understanding mm -hmm. required and someone needs to know more than one system, but you don't have that solution layer yet in your safe model because you can't justify it because of the size of your company. Right, right. Yeah, very good question. And uh, who was that speaking? Uh, this is Paul from Fred. Great. Thanks, Paul. Uh, great question. So yeah, don't, don't apply um, unnecessary force and don't go overboard. You don't need to, um, you don't need to declare these roles just because they exist and safe. apply what's necessary to do the job. And, uh, you know, usually what we see is that the, the smaller you are, the smaller the company is, and the, the smaller the product set is, there's a concentration here. We have system architects, but we don't have solution architects. We don't have enterprise architects because we don't need them. Our technology landscape isn't that complex. We can't justify the need. We can't justify the spend or the expense. Everything we need can be handled by these system architects and um, we don't really need a whole lot of cross organizational planning. We don't have multiple value streams. Therefore, we don't need enterprise architects per se. We don't need solution architects per se because everything we're doing is software based and we don't have very large systems, integrated systems, you know, potentially even cyber physical systems uh, to worry about. So everything's fairly simple on our end. Let's just have system architects that have the right mix of skills over here. But, um, I'm sure that your company someday would like to be more than 50 people. With well, the more company right, right now is 250 people and we do have a large number of systems. We've been around a very long time and those systems do talk to each other and there is large, very complicated dependencies. But due to our mm -hmm. headcount size, we can't justify that additional layer in between uh, that solution layer, um, yeah. managing multiple arts. Right, I see. Yeah, so, um, you know, this is where the, the art of our architecture um, maybe trumps the science of architecture um, and where, where the safe guidance isn't prescriptive, you know, use what makes sense. Um, I would start with the system architect point of view. Don't invest in solution architects or enterprise architects if it doesn't make sense. But as your solution set grows, as your technology landscape grows and as your business evolves, you may need to start scaling this way. But scale that way, only when needed. Does that help? <laughs> I mean, the, the, the challenge we have now is we have a, a lot of um, roadmap work to do, you know, to, and, and it almost feels like um, one of the challenges we've had now is just we've, we've worked at that system architect level for, for too long and we've got mm -hmm. this big challenge now to tie up all, all the actual overall strategies, roadmaps and everything together. So you need almost those specialists in those, in, in those common domains you have over to left, you know, what is the information strategy for your business? What is the, the application architecture and frameworks you want to build? What about security? You know, having those specialists come in and actually say, well, what do you want to do in security? And what do you want to roll out across all your products, across both internal, external products, everything? It, it almost feels like it's become jumbled because there's been that siloed view for too long. So then saying that you want to actually celebrate that and go more into this um, jack of all trades type model with your architects feels like that would probably just exasperate the problem. 
you know, you want to bring in the specialist to say, look, here's your, here's, here's some of the, the frameworks you want to build around security and your NFRs and your private pairs infrastructure and, and now roll that out across all your products and have those specialists come in to sort of get that expertise in those areas to, to help with that inconsistency across your products. Right. Yep. I can see a need for that. Um, but then um, I would also caution that you, maybe you need that expertise, but do you need that expertise full time? And do you need that expertise um, there in that specialized role for the foreseeable future? Um, or do you need that? Do you need that expertise temporarily? Is that uh, is that uh, is that a perspective that you could contract in for a short time, um, get the value you need, and then and then release that contract? Um, I'd say if you if you bring that person in and bring in these specialized roles, and you keep them in those specialized roles. Um, Eventually, if you're not careful, you can get into the situation where these specialized or so, these specialized roles are so specialized that they don't do anything else. Just like the problem with uh, development, right? We have developers who do this task, developers who develop really well, but they don't know how to test and they don't know how to write requirements or write stories, right? So then they may become the bottleneck. Or we have testers that don't know how to write the code and testers that aren't connected to the business. Therefore, all they do, all they know how to do is execute tests. And is that really where we need the value? Maybe we need that value today to, for some capacity, but are we going to continue to need that, that value in those specialized roles? So I think this is where you just need to take it in stride and do what's best for your business. Mm -hmm. I'd just be cautious. Um, let's see what else we have in here. Uh, polyglot, yes, <clears throat> polyglot. Um, Shamara asked, architecture has definitions of architecture domains, which are the ones on the left, and the architecture abstraction layers on the top. Could we think of them as focusing on conceptual, logical, and physical architecture? Ah, interesting. Um, so I'll give one perspective on that, but I'd be interested in the group's perspective, maybe even uh, Shamaro to, to chime in. Um, those, those examples, conceptual architecture, logical and physical architecture, I don't view as architectural domains. I view as architectural artifacts or outputs. So when we do the work, we're going to produce information that's of value to us and the enterprise, right? So um, to me, conceptual architecture diagrams, conceptual architecture models and logical architecture models and physical architecture models are great examples of architecture output that then is used to disseminate information, socialize ideas across the organization. But I wouldn't, I wouldn't put them on this diagram as either roles or, or architecture domains that we need specialization in. Uh, but who else has um, Sorry, Mark, if I can just add something to that while you're on the subject. <clears throat> I mean, at the end of the day, architecture is all about how we decompose the enterprise. And especially when the enterprise gets too complex, yeah, we need to find ways to decompose it, right? So domains is one, ways of, one way of decomposing it, which is essentially you're looking across the business information, application, technology, and then whatever else, other security or governance, architecture, et cetera, right? But then, uh, <clears throat> As, as, as systems get more complex, especially if you're, if you're going to the more waterfallish delivery methodology, you have had that concept of the solution is too large, hence you can't, uh, one person can't concentrate on everything. And also the level of stakeholders that you're working with is different as well. So you conceptually have these abstraction layers to actually say, yes, when you're communicating to a senior executive, we are not gonna go down to the physical architecture. That's our lowest level of abstraction. And then if, you have, if, if you're talking to a, uh, uh, you know, a developer, that's where you use the physical, archi physical uh, architecture. But whereas when you're talking to that senior executives, you, you tend to use the conceptual architecture because it hides the, the complexity that you don't need to communicate to them. And then that's, that's why typically that concept of the abstraction layers has evolved in architecture over time. And, and obviously in the traditional architecture roles, what's happened is actually a lot of those enterprise architects who are closer to the business end up having to communicate to these senior executives, hence they lose touch with the, the logical or the physical aspects of the architecture and they focus more on that conceptual. 
but whereas uh, nowadays when we are actually delivering delivering in more agile ways we are actually breaking the problem down into smaller uh, i guess uh, chunks to focus on the architecture so an enterprise architect can actually still work on what's what's necessary to communicate to a senior executive in the conceptual architecture but whereas still go down to some of the logical and physical apps aspects that they need to communicate to the other stakeholders right? it's mm-hmm. it's about developing the right architecture we point that you can use to communicate to the the respective individuals and the stakeholders that you're working with that's sort mm-hmm. of the way i thought about it mm-hmm. okay yeah i can appreciate that for sure um i think i would just separate the uh the communication tools from the architecture discipline and i view conceptual architecture logical architecture physical architecture as more artifacts that are used for communication purposes than architectural disciplines um just like we use epics features stories and capabilities to convey information um i and i've seen um several companies teams or arts that were very tempted to uh to declare story writer or story author roles or feature writer roles and designate people as the you know the ordained the, the blessed feature writers and that's what they did um and i've coached them away from that um some end up doing it some end up not doing it but i think my my personal position is uh conceptual architecture models and logical architecture and physical architecture models are great communication tools their views of the architecture that are tailored to particular audiences just like you said right we so we should have that capability we should be able to um roll the architecture and convey disseminate communicate that architecture um in the right ways to the right people at the right time so the right mechanisms just like uh you know we sort of do that with epic feature stories and the, the backlog items too so we kind of treat the two fairly similar um that we have we have our communication tools and the way that we the way that we capture information and store it and disseminate it um separate from the roles and responsibilities of the people yeah i can appreciate that and obviously you're right i mean you you spoke about the epics the features and the and the stories right so to me i think it it sort of makes sense the enterprise architects would be focusing on more of that epic level and then the solutions architect would be focusing on more of that feature level and the systems architect would be focusing on more of that story level mm-hmm. and and if if we go back to the traditional definitions of conceptual logical physical that's that's actually very similar to the epic features and the stories because stories are what's physical and gets implemented and then if you take a level up features are level up from an abstraction perspective and that's why it's it's sort of you know more at the level of our solution like architects are focusing on and then the enterprise architects they'll be looking at the epics and you know value streams which are another level up in terms of the abstraction so i think we are we're talking about the same thing right great great yeah i can see how all of those would sort of naturally align yeah um at the at the levels of safe sure um let's see rajiv the way i'm hearing it is this is more of a how best to resource the need i can feel we agree on what needs doing okay I see a question there is there a question here from um uh, what's his name Tejas did I get that right can a solution architecture group consisting of various domain expertise help fill the gap of both point in time expertise required versus long time strategic alignment um would you care to elaborate on that i'm not sure i understand the question yeah hi sure <clears throat> it's uh, uh tj here TJ. uh Yeah, <laughs> sort of the as um, so um, my point being that we discussed that the system architects they are very close to the system, so they probably will cover the more physical aspect or more, you know, where the rubber hits the road kind of scenario. An enterprise architect more towards value stream alignment um, and, and those kind of things. I I feel that solution architecture group uh, probably is a combination where it's not a single uh, person. but uh, but uh, a group of of domain experts like solution architect like security is hard to find if you if you align a security with with, with business or with with something like cloud or component architecture you you kind of get mm-hmm. one thing wrong because they are highly technical in nature and they are very much you know you cannot have a neurosurgeon working on on a, on an ent kind of thing so mm-hmm. my my feel is that a solution architecture group 
with with a with a with with a group of experts who are who have domain expertise and and they kind of uh, fill in that short term you know you mentioned about uh, having those those specific skills point in time to meet business requirements but then to kind of uh, expand them across the group so everyone else gets gets equipped with those skills mm-hmm. uh, uh, sag uh, could be a, a very good combination where you bring in those domain experts then you kind of spread the knowledge across and and, and have that strategic alignment versus point in time or, or mm-hmm. specific domain expertise and and this could be within an essential safe safe it could be within a, a large solution safe it could be within a full safe because it's really a a, a body of experts uh, driving uh, you know those practices mm-hmm. yeah yeah i agree um that's a pretty common pattern and can can work very effectively uh, say a solution architect team as a shared service to the R. Um, so you could apply that model to any one of these, maybe a system architect uh, team as a shared service to the R, or EA team as a shared, shared service. You could even go horizontally, right? Maybe we have a group of enterprise architects, solution architects, and system architects working collectively, and they provide uh, more of a you know, full value stream view of architecture and they dedicate dedicate themselves to an art so there are many ways to slice and dice the 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 teaming pattern and the engagement pattern with the arts i think the the most important aspect of any one of those teams especially if they're acting as a shared service is to um be part of the process right so be on the train if you are, if you're providing value, if you're supporting a release train or a set of release trains or a solution train, be on the train, be engaged, right? Um, be on the same cadence and synchronize with the train. Have your own backlogs. Work as work as an agile team. Be part of the program, right? Not not just a bolt on. Um, so actually, be on the train. And number two, work as an open system. So if you have a team of solution architects that um, provides that discipline, sort of as a service to the rest of the art then that's great. Seems like it would provide a, provide a lot of value. Just make sure that that group is open to other perspectives and doesn't become a solution architecture ivory tower in the organization. Thanks, Mark. How are you doing on, on time? Are you, are you good? I'm good. I could keep going if, if there's more time on the clock for the group. Yeah, so I'm, I'm happy to leave the call open for a little while and and um, progress. Uh, if people uh, want to hang around, if people had a hard close at uh, nine thirty uh, Melbourne time, then um, thank you for joining us, and we and we understand. Uh, but for those who are happy to hang around, um, sounds like Mark can hang around for a little bit as well. So uh, we will continue. If you're good to do that, Mark. Oh yeah, absolutely. Awesome. And maybe for anybody who's on the fence, who's thinking about jumping ship early, uh-huh. um, and maybe only have a couple minutes to spare, let me go down to my last slide. Um, and you might want to stick around for this. So, so the bottom line, there's the funnel, and at the bottom of the funnel is is this slide. Final thought. Um, if there was one additional thought that I'd want to convey to the group uh, as a final takeaway is. Think architecture as code. I think this is a very fundamental concept that I firmly believe is at the core of what we call agile architecture. And I've seen this idea work so well out in the field. You know, if architects can do this and get into this mode of thinking, then it can be a real game changer. Um, the first thing is to realize that everything that's flowing through the pipeline or through the value stream is an experiment. Nothing is cut and dried, nothing is easy, nothing is slam dunk unless we have done it before and it is proven in production. So consider everything an experiment until it's in the hands of the customers. If you approach architecture that way, then you will realize that we need to be fast. We need to validate or invalidate these leap of faith assumptions as quickly as we can. That means we need to do the architecture fast with whatever information we have available. And we need to architect in a way that enables development teams to develop and test and build infrastructure and de- deploy and release as quickly as they can. And they are dependent on us to give them minimum viable architecture. 
uh, and then have the ability to not only enable fast delivery, but capture feedback from the production environment after we go live, capturing qualitative, quantitative feedback, um, data about our, the performance of our systems in production, data about how our end users are using or not using or adopting or not adopting these systems, and how that correlates back to the original hypothesis and how we're measuring success here. We want to get to those learnings as quickly as we can because we need to validate or invalidate this experiment with the understanding that most experiments fail. We need to accelerate that learning cycle as fast as we can. And a lot of what we do as architects either enhances that cycle or inhibits that cycle. So when you're thinking about architecture, whatever role you're in and whatever discipline you're in and however you're approaching it, um, have that in mind for the benefit of, your benefit of your customers and the business and your internal stakeholders and your customers downstream. Developers are your customers, testers are your customers, operations are your customers. So do them a favor and do just enough architecture that matters, enable them to do their jobs effectively. Um, and don't commit yourself, your art or your customers to too much architecture concepts that have not yet been proven objectively in a production environment. I'll open it up. So that's very philosophical. And that's, that's Mark Ricks talking, um, not necessarily safe talking. So we don't have architecture as code in safe, but this is my personal philosophy toward architecture. Um, and um, when, I, when I coach architecture teams, I coach them in this direction. And um, when, when they operate in this way, I see game changing results, not only for the architecture, but how they enable continuous delivery through the entire organization. Sorry, Mark, I was just trying to say something. I don't know if you heard it. Uh, this, is, this is quite an interesting slide. I very much prescribe to this point of view, right? And obviously, uh, then one of the things that you were earlier starting to talk about was the, the ivory tower architects. And obviously, with the ivory tower architects also goes the point of view around uh, architectural governance. And I think what's, what's, what's important is actually uh, for us to understand how, how the architectural governance has to evolve in the context of moving into agile, because the architectural governance in the context of moving into agile is actually quite different to the architectural governance that used to exist in the waterfall world. So it's just about, you know, create, create a solution, get the, get the endorsement for the solution and then go and in, implement the solution. But now what we're doing is actually creating evolutionary architectures. And right. so that's, that's why it's, it's quite important that we think of when we think about in enterprise uh, or rather uh, the architectural governance in the agile context, we need a proper data driven strategy around how do we get input on the architecture to make sure that we have the right data to make the right decision at the right time. Right. So, and, and I think that's, that's, that's a concept that's still evolving in the architectural world. And a lot of people are still trying to, you know, get their heads head around it. To me, I think that, that, that's what's important when we think about architecture as code or architectural governance and in, in terms of moving into the agile world. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a, that's a great call out. And uh, I'm just gonna do something on the fly here. See if, see if you guys appreciate this or not. Um, erase all the ink. So, <laughs> A couple of ele uh, elements of what you said are highly important, right? So I'll kind of pick out what I thought were the highlights. And one of the highlights was we have to understand what the business intends to get out of this stuff, <laughs> right? So we need to be connected to the needs of the business and our customers so that we, we really understand why the architecture is important. That will guide us through the entire process. And maybe in a large enterprise, that starts here. I could see it starting there. Large solution, large initiative, a um, lot of money is, is at stake. Maybe a lot of companies are going through this right now because of the COVID crisis. They're having to do a big business model pivot. Scaled Agile, we're right here right now. <laughs> big business model pivot, right? Our world was turned completely upside down. Um, maybe your worlds were turned completely upside down. Maybe your, your C-suite is having these kinds of conversations. What are we going to do next? How are we going to adapt? 
and maybe some big business architecture level changes are happening that we need to know about. And that's going to cause pressure to deliver new systems, new innovations rapidly. So we need to be able to understand what, what's in it for the business and our customers and somehow get that information down here to the highly technical bits, right? So that we can measure it. Because at the end of the day in production, we need to be able to mine our systems for data that connects back to this hypothesis. And along the way, we'll apply some amount of governance to make sure that we're staying on track with that hypothesis or with that vision. Make sure that we're proceeding in the right direction, right? And everybody understands why we're doing this and what's in it. We're doing our part and uh, we're taking that in. That information is going from the enterprise architects to the solution architects. Those handoffs are smooth and the solution architects are building their models and developing their architecture thinking. We're finding what they get from the EAs and then they're delivering something usable to the system architects, which are maybe a condensed view of that. So all of that communication collaboration needs to be in place. Um, and then maybe we need to govern for that along the way. Um, so that down here, once we're, once we're in production, we're gonna be mining those, those systems, looking directly to the technology to give us feedback that will allow us to answer the question, yes or no on that. But specifically on, on governance, I think part of your question was, how are we going to do that? Am I right? Yep, absolutely. How do we govern? Mm -hmm. So we need to enable this, this feedback loop um, that is in constant motion from the business down into the tech and back to the business through that continuous virtuous cycle. How we govern that information, how we govern that flow is very, very important. Um, and just to call out a few highlights, what, we're, what we don't want to do in agile architecture and in SAFE is do traditional things like implement architecture review boards and change management review boards yeah. and um, CABs and security reviews. Um, these highly manual, highly schedule dependent ceremonies that require people to, people's schedules to align so that they can show up at the, you know, at, at designated times and review artifacts, not review code or the binary, not review the actual product, but review some abstraction or approximation of the actual product and make a subjective judgment based on that information, right? Of whether we're staying in compliance or not. The short answer is <clears throat> back here to architecture as code. If part of that governance is we want to make sure that we're adhering to architecture policy, we have these policies in place for a reason, right? We need to go with an API strategy um, because we need to be more loosely coupled about the architecture and we need to govern these endpoints in a certain way because it's all part of the architecture vision and it needs to operate this way to serve the business. Well, we need to be able to check the actual implementation against those architecture policies. So how are we going to do that? Are we going to do it with checklists? Or can we take those architecture policies and requirements out of the checklists and out of the specifications and out of the policy documents and actually write them as executable tests and put them into our test suites and have them run, run alongside our functional tests, our non-functional tests, our regression tests, our security vulnerability scans uh, as, part of the, as part of the deployment pipeline, part of the tool chain. So part of this infrastructure as code thought is how can we get the architecture off the whiteboard and out of the specifications, out of the policy documents and into an executable format so it can be run against the binary so that we have more objective evidence that we're on track or off track governance wise. Take the uncertainty as much out of the picture as we can so we can really narrow in on fact-based information about governance. What do you think about that? Uh, that that definitely makes sense. I think you know when when I spoke about the you know data driven driven strategy around architecture decisions, that's that's essentially what I'm report or what I was referring to. You know how how do we make sure that we are implementing what we planned upfront? And obviously, the the feedback loop that you were looking at 
if you go back the few slides where you're actually drawing it, is that still there? Yeah, so if, if you look at this, what uh, Mark, going from a, a top-down direction, right? So top-down direction, especially when we are making a business pivot, business strategy pivot, that makes sense. But they have a you know, large number of initiatives that are kicked off, which are which may not have originally aligned to the business strategy. So how do we actually make sure that you know those initiatives when they are running, they can actually still align to the business strategy? How do and 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 to to me, I think that's about maybe let's make sure that we have the data coming from those initiatives that are being implemented to make sure we can still align it back to the business strategy in terms of whichever value stream that we want to invest in, so that we can optimize the business, right? Yes. So yeah. it, I mean, let me take an example. So if 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 we take the HR value stream, hiring, uh, leaving. Uh, sorry. You're cutting out. You're cutting out. Yeah. Can you still hear me, Ma? Can yes. Can everyone still hear me? I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm, I forgot to introduce myself earlier. The HR is speaking, by the way. Okay. Um. Uh, I mean, if, if 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 you take the HR value stream going from sourcing to uh, recruiting, recruiting to onboarding, onboarding to uh, leaving the organization, you know, organizations usually get a lot of value when 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 they can make sure that they can get the right candidates on board. So they might say, look, we want to <clears throat> optimize the and make make sure that we get the right candidates in place, right? And, and and they might say yes. We want to invest to in, in, improve this, uh, the the source into recruiting piece of the value chain stream. But if they have initiatives that are already in place that are delivering, let's say, integration with multiple talent pools across LinkedIn and whatever else across all the the recruitment agencies and whatnot to be able to source the candidates, we want to make sure that we can align that initiatives to this source into recruiting part of the value stream that you're trying to optimize. Right? So there, there's two aspects to it. One is obviously, as you just mentioned, going from top down. And the other one is, you know, the, the kicking of initiatives, we need to be able to tie it to that business strategy of let's optimize the source into recruiting. Right? And, and, and to me, I think that those are the two things that are important. Right. So it sounds like in that scenario, this is a question mark. You, you get involved in, at some point in the value stream and you don't have that connection back to the business. And so you're not really sure what we intend to get out of this. Therefore, we don't really understand why we're doing the architecture and, and it leaves a big missing piece of the puzzle. Exactly. Right. Yeah. So the question is, what do we do at that point? Well, I will be very blunt. Um, as architects, you should pull the cord. And you know what that means, right? Stop the line. <laughs> Stop the line. It is incumbent upon you to stop the line. Step up sorry, as Mark. leaders. I'm, I'm sorry, Mark. I, I hear you saying stop the call, right? But to me, uh, I also subscribe to the, the belief that do no evil, right? When it comes to architecture, do no evil. And then pulling the code, you know, to me, it seems like you're, you're trying to decrease the business agility, right? So to me, it's about how do we, how do we make sure we let the business still continue with it, but then uh, do just enough architecture to figure out how what is that value stream that you're trying to optimize through working on this particular initiative instead of having to go through a massive strategy development exercise or strategy redevelopment exercise right yeah so i mean again this is this is mark ricks talking not necessarily scaled agile but i think a lot of my uh, my peers and counterparts in the company and in the scaled agile community would agree with me on this maybe not everybody but I am, I am a, I'm a firm, staunch, 100% believer in customer centricity. Always think about the customer first. So when you have a decision to make like this and you're wondering which way to go, right? Should I step in and stop the line or should I not step in and stop the line? If I stop the line, what's the consequence going to be? Well, maybe the, the production line comes to a screeching halt and we slow down delivery. Okay, well, that's bad, right? So alarm bells go off and, and you might say, well, that's slowing down delivery and uh, we're, we're not going to meet our commitments if I stop the line. Okay, that's a consequence. Mm -hmm. If we continue to roll forward, what's the consequence? So you might need to have a cost of delay determination in each scenario. And for me, the tiebreaker in these situations is always what would the customer want me to do? If I think about what the customer would be willing to pay for if I told them or if I gave them the choice, right? What, would you, what do you want to pay for? What should I do? 
customer? Is there more value in letting this go or is there more value in stopping for a while to make sure that we have our ducks in a row and we understand your Two perspective? Minutes. Right, okay. <laughs> I wish I'd known earlier. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for that. So, um, so the decision I would make based on the information that you've given, which is very high level, is um, I, would, I would immediately step up and I would start to ask why and how can we get connected to business? I try to do that in a way that doesn't, doesn't you know, maybe completely stop the line. How can we keep rolling and maybe catch up with that business perspective? But I'd be looking for ways to get that business perspective and that alignment, that connectivity into the value stream as quickly as possible. Yeah. And I think the customers would appreciate me for that. That's what they would want me to do. Absolutely. And, and that's exactly what I was referring to in terms of the just enough architecture. Right? So you quick, very quickly tying it up to which, which strategic element uh, of, of the value stream are we trying to align to. <clears throat> okay, cool. Yeah, great. Well, thanks, Mark. Thank you for that. Yeah, I love these philosophical deep dives. <laughs> <laughs> so I think that's all the time we have for today. I don't want to take us over time. Really want to respect the time box. But I do want to thank you very, very much, uh, both Em and Adrian, for having me in and for you guys for listening. Hopefully you got something out of this. Um, if you didn't, I hope you've got beer in the fridge that can help, um, help at least in some way. <laughs> thank you for the rest of the day. Um, Thanks for joining us, Mark. Uh, really appreciate you taking the time out of your day to uh, to chat with the with the folks and and answer the very many questions. Um, we've got a few folks asking about the the slides. Um, hoping maybe you'll be able to drop those through to to us, and we can pass them on to the group. Uh, sure, I can do that. Yep, I'll package yeah. them up and send them your way, Anne. Thanks, Mark. Um, and uh, maybe we'll uh, con you into coming and visiting us again one day. I hope I get invited back. That's all I hope for with these things. It's, it's either it's either I get shut out and never invited back, or they want me back. <laughs> uh, we'll, we'll have you back. We'll, we'll think of another <laughs> curly topic for you, um, folks. Thank you very much for for coming along uh, today. Um, if you have ideas for future meetups, uh, feel free to send a mail to uh, either me or Adrian or meetup at prettyagile.com and we will see what magic we can arrange.